Hey, my name is Laura Kaler. This is my Hard Times and the Critics presentation. I am presenting on Christopher Barnes' criticism from Hard Times, Fancy as Practice, that's uh, found on page 443 through 449 in our fourth Norton Critical Edition. The arguments that the writer is responding to uh, are numerous. <laughs> the contemporary reviewers, this general argument uh, that I think he's responding to, right out the gate he makes mention of it, and I think the rest of the ar article just argues for how this is more than just a didactic novel, as some contemporary reviewers dismiss it as. Um, just a moral, even F.R. Levis says it's a good moral fable um, so I believe Barnes is reacting to that. Also, to George Bernard Shaw, F.R. Levis, George Gissing, uh, Sylvier Monod, and Raymond Williams all point out that Dickens' depiction of trade unions in hard times is simpli a simplistic caricature. Um, Monod, again, criticizes that the thesis of the novel is unclear and unpersuasive and just dismisses it as sentimental socialism. And Barnes talks about this critic opposition, the critic's opposition with fact and fancy as problematic or simplistic. So this theme of just being, you know, just falling flat. <laughs> and then the problematic fancy, um, because it's direct strategic resistance, is unrealistic and ineffective, specifically in the cases of Sissy Jupe with uh, Mr. Harthouse and her persuading him to leave when she's so uneducated and her eloquence of speech, and also the ineffectiveness of the workers with the employers. Um, Barnes is certainly disagreeing. Uh, he is furthering the understanding. I can't just write this up as simply an industrial novel as it's lumped or a didactic novel, just a good moral fable. Um, but specifically in this critique about the industrial aspect of the trade union, uh, Barnes says, that Dickens is also interested in relations of power across society, and that's key. Our relationships between teacher and pupil, parent and child, husband and wife, mill owner and laborer, uni union leader and union members, governor and governed, and here's the key ultimately between the middle and working class. Um, Barnes also wants to add tactical fancy to the definition, making it more formidable, uh, a more formidable force to bring down the symbolic world of fact the text creates. And these are just all really big ideas. And this is something that I kind of had a hard time with the way it was situated in the article. So I'll talk about that later. Um, also, Barnes is wanting to highlight a Dickens' attack on utilitarianism the way John Stuart Mill does, giving that some credibility. Um, where John Stuart Mill, when he was 21, uh, came to the end of his one-sided education and realized there must be something more and that something being the arts. Uh, also, Barnes is certainly reacting to uh, this criticism that Stephen Blackpool is just a failure, um, unable to accurately depict the trade unions of the day. Um, Barnes is going to argue that Dick, Dickens uses the trade union as, as an example of how all systems are partial and reductive. Um, so this one specific to represent a greater whole other than what the critics want it to be more rich in, if that makes sense. So the motivation of the writer's argument, he sets this out in three sections is fact, systems as power, and Blackpool's metal. So fact, again, this attack on utilitarianism, giving it that credibility, being like what John Stuart Mill uh, fought for, <laughs> and 
And Dickens is pointing to the importance of cultivating the individual and yes, through the arts, but this individual um, in opposition to this greater force, uh, the individual is like a subaltern here uh, to those in authority. And then systems as power that goes into that. Those in authority need to be in dialogue with their subalterns. And this is really focused on the middle class with the working class. Um, this dialogue is needed to have success in social change. And also what's motivating Barnes is this criticism on Blackpool's muddle where Manad wants to dismiss Stephen as having an ignorant mind and a muddled brain. Uh, Barnes has something to say about that. Uh, does the writer convince you? Why or why not? I am convinced by Barnes that uh, Dickens' description of the union meeting and the subsequent decisions of the workers is a good example, both of his middle class perspective and of working class resistance to such a middle class representation. The result is an ambiguity that depicts both sides honestly, and this is really what I think is great about Dickens and I think Barnes is really hitting the nail on the head here that this ambiguity that the critics are upset about um, is a vehicle for Dickens to depict both sides honestly and where they say that this is unrealistic that is just where the realism is uh, you're looking at a different end in mind. Um, but I am confused on this point about adding the tactical hidden non-confrontational resistance to the definition of fancy, just because the way it's presented early in the article, the criticism is that the direct resistance of Sissy and Stephen are what's unrealistic and ineffective. And it seems that Barnes situating that if we're going to add this hidden non-confrontational, then that's going to open up the, the real power for this argument. But it really seems like the direct is what uh, Barnes values. And I didn't put the quote up here, but I'll read it. It's on page 448, right under Blackpool, the heading Blackpool's Metal. Uh, Barnes writes, Stephen Blackpool functions in the novel to define himself in opposition to both the alienating inhumane policies of Bounderby and the factory and to the unthinking loyalty demanded by Slackbridge and the union. His function is parallel to Sissy's opposition to Gradgrind's utilitarian family and school with one significant difference. Blackpool predominantly engages in direct strategic actions, not in disguise tactical practice. His confrontations with the trade union and with Bounderby demonstrate the bankruptcy of the bourgeois ideal of the autonomous individual. And I know that's a lot to not have there to follow. Maybe you could pull up your follow along. Um, I should have said that before I read it. But uh, this whole idea that it's the direct action that is not disguised uh, by Blackpool that makes his uh, demonstration so effective. I'm still a little confused by that. And maybe because in this article, Barnes doesn't really develop the sissy jupe criticism. Uh, but overall, I do agree with the points that he's making and uh, appreciated his contribution to the argument.